sort of that other region of Tempranillo. Ribera del Duero makes some of the most powerful, full-bodied, yet wonderfully elegant red wines of Spain. This is sort of that other region of Tempranillo. And Rioja gets all the attention and is honestly perhaps the most known for its, its Tempranillo wines. But Ribera gives a whole other personality and honestly shows the, the extreme potential of what Tempranillo can do in a different type of climate. And it's not, it's not even two hours away, which is what's uh, amazing. So to paint a little picture about um, the history of this area, similar to Rioja, Rivera was an area that had some vineyards and already some wine production happening in this area in the 1800s. Has been happening for centuries upon centuries here, but actual commercial sold wine um, was beginning to happen and, and um, have a bit of a foothold in the early part of the 1800s. I can't talk about the story of Rivera del Duero without talking about the story of Vega Sicilia. Uh, this is the first winery there. It's one of the oldest wineries in Spain, and it is considered one of the most enigmatic, important wineries of Spain. So collectors that, that buy wines purely for their value and their tradeability, Vega Sicilia is one of those wineries that produces those types of wines. It's super iconic. So Vega was started in about the 1830s um, and this um, very um, forward thinking farmer and winemaker who started this winery brought clippings from Bordeaux of Cabernet and Merlot and actually most of the Bordeaux blending varieties. And he planted them here in Rivera del Duero. So at, now keep in mind, this wasn't a DO at the time. This was just land, right? Um, and Rivera del Duero is, it exists in the autonomous region of Castilla y Leon. Castilla y Leon is super large and really is part of this high elevated meseta, which is then that northern part of Spain with just extreme conditions. Rivera del Duero is more on the eastern side of Castilla y Leon. So in order to paint the picture for you, imagine arid land, high elevation, you can do see some mountainous area, but um, it's, it's actually quite high and the mountains may be in the distance where you are, but this is where the Duero River moves through. So remembering that the Duero River starts in Spain and makes its way all the way to Portugal and ends at Porto. So there's a lot of very important wine regions all along the Duero River. And Ribera del Duero is really probably the most, most important one for Spain. So here, very arid, very dry climate, but it has extreme weather. This is, this is textbook continental climate. So they've got four distinct seasons. Every season you feel and experience all the typicity of that season. Summer is short and brutal. Um, in fact, they've got a saying here that it's nine months of winter and three months of hell, which is really just saying they've got so much cold weather through the majority of their year. And then when summertime hits, it's very, very hot. Now, because of those elevations, Rivera del Duero does get beautiful diurnal swing in the temperature. So imagine 30 to 40 degrees differences from daytime to nighttime. This is key to what ends up happening in the quality of the wine that's put out here. Because they've got this very, very extremely hot summertime, it's those cold evenings, once the sun is down, that really allow the vines to relax during that really critical ripening stage. What this does is adds extreme phenolic ripeness to the Tempranillo here. So the Tempranillo of Rivera del Duero is very different than the Tempranillo of Rioja. Same basic primary flavors where you get cherry, strawberry, 
some primary, just some natural spice and florality. But what will come out of Ribera del Duero, which in fact they call the variety a different thing, they don't call it Tempranillo here, they call it Tinto Fino, which it's arguable, but they believe this is its own specific local clone of Tempranillo. So it's related to the Tempranillo of Rioja, but it's its own variety. So Tinto Fino will be blacker and it makes wines with more alcohol levels. So very typical for Ribera del Duero to have wines in the 14, 14.5 range. And that's just because of that temperature that I'm describing. They've got that very, very hot summer and then that nice swing between day and night, 30 to 40 degrees differences. So you get these extremely fully ripened um, Tempranillo grapes. So back to Vega Sicilia which started in the 1800s. Not only were they making wines predominantly of Tempranillo, but they had the Bordeaux varieties, Cabernet and Merlot and so on. And we're blending these into the wines. And they were making fine wines long before any winery had even dreamed of making wines like that. And that was unheard of, completely unheard of. And then, the story of phylloxera that came to France and then ruined the vines of Europe. And the people of France that were in the wine business needed to find places to get wine from. And most of them really settled in Rioja. That was the main source of how to produce and provide grapes and wine back up to France that could be bottled as Bordeaux and sold as Bordeaux and various other French regions. Ribera del Duero also got some of the benefit of that phylloxera downtime that France had to experience. So Ribera did also get some investment from the French, but it wasn't quite as much. But Vega Sicilia really was already producing that Bordeaux style wine. And then when Spain became known for Rioja, making that kind of wine, that really Vega got to sort of ride the wave of also having some commercial success and also being known across the world as this incredible winery that was making these beautiful, powerful, long-aged wines that were unlike anything else they'd ever had from Spain. Vega Sicilia is still um, in production and they still make wines very much in that traditional way. Unico is their wine that is the most known that they make this way and they age it for 10 years before they release it and it's one of the most sought after and collected wines of Spain now. So Ribera del Duero started from, a, from an area that most regions never ever do. Most wine regions all start with bulk wine and it takes some time for, for fine wine to really be the thing that that region will start to be known for. Maybe a little bit will be produced and it will be so hard for wineries to turn to it. But really, modern Ribera del Duero really starts with the story of Vega Sicilia and it started with high-end wine. So the other wineries that popped up in Ribera del Duero as the years move on are all making these high-quality, low-production, fine wines. Moving into the more modern times, getting into the 1900s and very much at the end of the 20th century, another innovator came into Rivera del Duero and started producing magical wines and got a whole new wave of recognition for the area, and that's Alejandro Fernandez. So Alejandro Fernandez started to also make wines similar style but rather than blending in all those foreign grapes and doing long, long aging like Bordeaux and like Rioja, decided to make wines only using Tinto Fino, just focusing on the main and true to the heart of Ribera del Duero variety, which is Tempranillo or Tinto Fino. And rather than doing all that long, long aging, doing shortened aging in smaller French oak barrels, and so begins the story of Tinto Mascara and Condado de Aza, which are now extremely well known and considered benchmark wines of Ribera del Duero. And many of the producers of Ribera del Duero 
have followed in the footsteps of Alejandro Fernandez with making 100% Tempranillo wines. So Vega Sicilia, with their Unico bottling, is actually one of the few producers that makes that kind, where they're blending in other varieties, maybe a little bit of Cabernet, and doing a really, really long-aged wine to make a very subtle wine. Most of the wines of Rivera del Duero are this very full-bodied, very intense, iron alcohol, single varietal wine, and often single vineyard as well. The grape varieties of Rivera really all come down to one variety, and that's Tempranillo. Tempranillo in Rivera del Duero is known as Tinto Fino, and Tinto Fino is really the local name, and perhaps it is the local clone of Tempranillo. In Castilla y Leon, this is an area that was regionally owned by different royalty, right? So the different grapes tend to have different varietal names, depending on where you are in Castilla y Leon. Tinto Fino is the local name for it here. It produces pretty dark black berries, and the typical aromas and flavors of Tinto Fino are cherry, strawberry, usually some rose, and other types of florals and a little bit of spices in there as well that are just natural spiciness of the varietal itself, not just the spices that you would get from aging in oak. Other grapes do grow in Rivera del Duero, but they represent such minor amounts of what is planted. And so you rarely find um, wines that have anything other than Tempranillo in them. That really is the main grape that's used in this area. So it's, it's the true signature. You do find French varietals. The most typical French varietals you'll find here are the ones from Bordeaux, which were one influenced by uh, Aloy Lacanda, who is the man who began Vega Sicilia, and he planted Cabernet, Merlot, and other Bordeaux varieties. But also the people of Bordeaux brought their varieties with them as well. So Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot are somewhat common um, in Rivera del Duero, but really not used in, in, a, in a large capacity. There is one white variety growing in Rivera del Duero, which is Albio Mayor. Pretty uncommon to find white wines um, from this area, but we'll see them every now and then, and it is a really special treat when you can find one. The terroir in Rivera del Duero is, like I've said, extreme continental climate. Rivera del Duero sits high on the Meseta, so it is pretty high elevation. Many of the elevation levels of Rivera are in this 2,000 and 3,000 feet above sea level. So what that does is create that, that really big diurnal temperature swing between day and night, which is really key during that growing season. There's several different soil types, and that's because the whole region is, is following along the riverbanks of the Duero River. So the majority of it is sedimentary type soils. You will find Plenty of vineyards that have pretty heavy clay content, definitely in those lower areas where that clay settles. Um, and in the higher areas, you'll find more limestone and a bit more chalkiness. And that's where the waters really receded um, a long, long time ago. And in between all the rocky pebbles, it's really typical to find very, very rocky vineyards in Rivera del Duero. So those are your three main types. You get those rocky soils, which are great for drainage, um, very good for high acid production, which is really good for those long aging Rivera del Duero wines. Limestone and chalk in the most high elevations, that's where you're going to get the most acidity and the best, most serious wines, honestly. And then clay, more clay heavy soils in the lower lying areas where you'll get more broadness, more texture, a lot more heat and, and um, rich fruitiness um, from the Tempranillo growing in the clay heavy soils. Another important thing to understand with the terroir here is that summer is pretty extreme. And because of the elevation here, and there's not a lot of mountains, this part of Spain just doesn't get a lot of cloud coverage. So these vines are just getting, they're getting all of it. They're getting lots of sun, they're not getting much rain, and they're getting tons of heat. So what's typical in Rivera is a type of vine training system, which is called invaso, which means that they're also, it's like, it's like a little bush, and that's sometimes referred to as bush vines. So rather than seeing the vines up on trellising systems, which would bring them higher to the sky, closer to the sun, 
but keep them quite low to the ground where they can at least have some humidity, right? That they get from being close to the earth, which is good because this is a low rain um, area. So if they can get a little bit more humidity, they can get a little bit more moisture on the leaves and they can create these larger canopies that will protect the bunches of grapes that are growing underneath them. The bush trained vines are really hard to take care of because they're so low to the ground. So machines don't harvest them and they, they really don't do any of the work. This is all done by hand and they tend to yield a little bit less because there's just not that much room, honestly, to have lots and lots of grape bunches growing here. So the, this is really common to see all of these little bushes all over the vineyards of Rivera del Tuero, but it's really important for protecting those bunches from not getting too much sun exposure so that they don't dry out or turn into raisins before they're picked. There's a lot of commonality of the winemaking style in Rivera del Tuero. I find that the region um, has wineries that really, they know what their signature style is and the wineries tend to not stray too much from that winemaking style. Um, there is quite a bit of investment in the area, so most wineries are equipped with stainless steel tanks. Um, so it's kind of just the classic winemaking methods that you would see in any high quality winery, which is temperature controlled fermentation in stainless steel tanks, then moving into oak barrels for aging, smaller oak barrels to 25 liters, sometimes larger barrels, depending on the producer. Different than Rioja, Rivera del Duero mostly uses French oak. Some wineries do use some American oak. Often they'll blend the two together if they do. So maybe 50% French oak use and 50% American oak use, or no American oak at all, and just stick with the French oak, really because a lot of the wineries here are not doing long, long exposures in the oak barrels. 12 and 24 months is a really typical range for most Rivera del Duero wines, and the grapes can handle it um, because they are such concentrated uh, wines coming out of Rivera del Duero. They really need that time in barrel just to have the micro-oxygenation to soften the tannins and even just all of the acid and, and the structure of the wine. And then the wine will be in bottle uh, for perhaps a few months, a year, or longer. Rivera del Duero follows the same aging classification as Rioja. So you will have Crianzas, Reservas, and Grand Reservas, each one aged subsequently longer than the other with some regulated time, both in barrel and then in bottle. I will say it's really not as commonly used though as it is in Rioja. Rioja truly embraces that that aging classification and, and Rivera del Suero I find that it's quite split. Um, you will find some classic producers like to, to stick with Crianza, Reserva, and Gran Reserva. Many don't use it at all and still make it in a Reserva or perhaps a Gran Reserva level of wine. Um, but don't use that aging classification because it's it's not as signature to the region like it is with Rioja. Pour myself a little bit in the glass here. Not too much, so we have lots of room to swirl and aerate the wine. So this is 100% Tempranillo, like the vast majority of wines from Rivera del Duero, or Tinto Fino, as they say there. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is look at the wine and talk about the appearance of it. And the best way to analyze the appearance of the wine is just a little bit of an angle on a surface that's nice and bright and white. Um, so we can see all of the variation of the, of the wine. So the wine that I have in my glass is, is deeply pigmented. It's clearly a very concentrated wine. You can tell that it's had a long maceration time lots of time where the liquid has spent time with the skins. Um, I can't read through the wine. Um, it, is, it is nice and deep and concentrated and opaque. Um, there is um, a, a fair amount of variation. Um, this wine that I'm having is from 2017, so it's, it is quite young. The color here is a sort of bright, bright purple color, and it does fade to sort of a fuchsia um, rosy rim at the edge. Uh, but 
not too watery. Even towards the edge, you're getting a lot of pigmentation. So next we're gonna give it a nice big swirl. The aromas on this wine are powerful. Um, lots and lots of fruit here. And the fruit is dark, um, really sort of deep maraschino cherry is the first thing that I'm smelling here. Sort of Tempranillo always smells like cherry to me. And depending on where it's from, sort of different variation of cherries. But this one here is dark, juicy cherry, almost like a maraschino. Blackberry, super ripe cassis, currant. It almost has a, a port-like quality to the nose. Um, super ripe fruit. As it opens up, there is sort of a pretty dried herb quality to it as well. Almost like a mint, nice spearminty quality to it. Bold, powerful aromas though. Almost a little bit of alcohol heat as well. I can tell even before uh, this wine is on my palate that um, it's going to be um, a high alcohol content wine. Give myself a little taste. As I tasted the wine, I made sure to get it all over my palate, on my gums and on my teeth. Um, I'm really feeling the tannins here. Just as, as we expected, this wine is bold. It has a nice sort of full alcohol body to it. Very similar uh, flavors that I was getting on the nose. Really ripe fruit. Um, lots of spice, tons of this vanilla bean from the oak that it's it's definitely seen. Lots of sort of spice quality to it, cinnamon. Sort of a touch of this um, herb quality that I was getting on the nose is coming through on the palate as well. Um, and definitely tannin, lots and lots of tannin here. This is sort of a Perfectly classic example of a bold, young Tempranillo from Roberto Duero. And the flavor profiles here are perfect for people who like Cabernet. These intense, concentrated fruit, fruit forward wines with a lot of this sort of spice and um, the round polished quality from a, ta a time spent in oak. Um, really sort of nutty vanilla quality to it. Um, this wine also has sort of a, a super long spicy finish. So awesome for people who, who are lovers of Cabernet.